Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's Mike here at Game From Scratch, and did you want to peek into the future to see how Godot was going to develop? Well, we just got exactly that. They just published their priorities list. This is a wish list of improvements and features they want to make to the Godot engine. You can think of this as a roadmap with a little bit less commitment, because there's nothing to say that these are going to happen, but these are things that they would like to see happen. Uh, and basically, if you want to give money to Godot, this is what your money is going to contribute towards. That is the idea behind it anyway. So you can see it's broken down into a number of different categories categories, core editor, platform scripting, uh, and all these other things. And each one of these, you can drill down and learn a little bit more about it. So you see here, boom, you get details of what core actually means. And in core, you find out additional details there. So we're basically going to go through all of these and find out what the add-ons or what the future holds for the Godot game engine. First one, we have overhaul add-on startups. As community grows and users more and more add-ons, uh, we found that the current add-on startup logic is reaching its limits as something uh, you need to reload the editor for new add-ons to work. That's why we intend to overhaul to make this experience seamless. So just better add-on starting support. Reliable headless command line export. Uh, headless basically is a version of the game engine running without the renderer. Uh, this enables you to do things like servers. Uh, so a bigger project often rely on continuous integration to test and deploy their projects. They need to be able to export games from lean environments that don't implement a graphical interface. For this, we need to make headless command line export more reliable, uh, improve performance of scene multi-threading. So we put a lot of effort into adding ways to split the work of nodes into multiple threads. This can lead to great leaps in terms of performance. Unfortunately, many nodes are structured in a way that makes it difficult for them to take advantage of multiple threads. We need to audit our current nodes and fix the ones that are reliant on being single-threaded. This is a big part of what DOTS was all about in the Unity world. So as GPUs hit their speed limits, what they did is added more and more cores. So that means you need to make your workflows parallel. And one way to do that is to make it so everything is multi-threadable. Uh, we also have multiple uh, make optimizations throughout the core. So this is just general optimizations. Much of the engine would benefit from a careful evaluation of the current performance bottlenecks and improvements to ensure that it is running as fast as possible. Godot 4 drastically improved the overall architecture of Godot, but there is a lot of legacy code that is uh, not benefiting from architectural improvements. Need to seek those out and fix them. And then create more benchmarks. Pretty self-explanatory there. On the physics side of things, this one here, uh, this one you're gonna get a video about very soon, probably with the Dev 7 release, uh, because Good, um, Jolt was actually just integrated into the master code base on GitHub for Godot. So uh, this one is uh, happening, uh, but what you're seeing is they're talking about making it the default 3D physics engine. This makes a ton of sense. Uh, right now, it's a drop in replacement for Godot physics. Godot physics has issues. They actually removed it before and then added it back in. Uh, it looks like Jolt is going to be the new... Uh, future physics, like the number one star here. Uh, but I'm gonna have an updated video very soon once that is formally released and you don't have to build it yourself from code. But Jolt is now a module of Godot. It looks like in the future, they're gonna make it the default way. And then adapt the way Godot ex uh, exposes physics to mirror Jolt. So as much as our nodes are made to be compatible with multiple physics engines, uh, the existing integration of Jolt via the Godot Jolt add-on is not optimal as there are numerous features that can't be implemented in Godot due to the current way the physics work, or the systems work. In addition to integrating uh, Jolt as a default physics engine, we want to modernize our node bindings in order to fully exploit the new libraries. Basically, take advantage of the capabilities of Jolt that they currently can't do. Uh, then we've got some rendering uh, improvements. So the sign distance field global illumination, they're going to overhaul it to improve performance uh, for global illumination. They're very proud of it, but we think we can push performance and quality even further. There is a long-term effort, uh, but it is something we are very excited about. Uh, I covered this video in the past about um, Juan's HDD AGI replacement for SDFGI. It's a new global illumination elect, um, technology. Global illumination basically being the way that global light and secondary balances, etc., happens in the scene. So basically, if you're in a wide open world, uh, global illumination is often the lighting that is used. Uh, significantly improved post-processing effects and add common effects. So post-processing Processing effects are weak spot in Godot's renderer. Performance and quality are both the worst, are both worse than they would like. Uh, we want to overhaul or replace most of our post-processing effects in order to achieve both better performance and higher quality. Uh, add, our, add a rendering compositor to allow controlling render pass uh, order. The goal of the rendering compositor is to give users fine-tuned control over the order of rendering operations and allow them to implement more custom behavior within the renderer. Uh, enhanced graphics debugging, including VRAM debugging and better information from the current profiler. That title basically says it all. Uh, add shader templates to allow overriding the built-in sh uh, shader. Shader templates can be used to have full control over the shaders used to render your assets. This allows you to both optimize your shader by removing unnecessary parts and to dramatically change your shader by adding custom 
custom behavior. Implement texture and mesh streaming. Pretty self straightforward there. It's useful if you've got very large worlds, uh, so you can load stream things in as you need them. Uh, expose a ray tracing API and eventually use it for built-in effects. This one is a big one because uh, the world of ray tracing, you love it or hate it, it is becoming more and more and more pronounced. Uh, hardware ray tracing is slowly becoming more widespread. Soon it will be common for all desktop computers to support hardware ray tracing and soon after mobile devices will as well. We want to expose an API for hardware ray tracing through our rendering device so that users can begin to make use of it. And then uh, eventually we want to use that API to leverage hardware ray tracing in forward plus renderer, add a deferred renderer. A deferred rendering is a technique that can be used to increase performance in certain situations at the cost of flexibility. As Godot users create more complex games, we are seeing more games that would benefit from trading the flexibility that comes with our current renderer for more performance. Overhaul Lightmap GI to improve baking workflow, performance, and features. Lightmap GI needs a lot of polish and improvements for us to meet the goals we have set for it. Baking times are slower uh, than we want, and it often takes too much manual effort to get bakes to achieve the quality that users need. Uh, implement a web GPU back end for web exports. I thought this was in there already, but I guess not. Uh, WebGPU is a new and modern API, offers direct access to GPUs, exposing features that are not otherwise available on the web. Once WebGPU is supported, it will be possible to export high fidelity forward plus and mobile projects to the web. On the animation side of things, they improve and polish the new Skeletal Modifier 3D. Uh, it was introduced in 4.3, helps users to modify and add new functionality to bones via scripts, want to build upon the new structure to add new features to it, such as bone springs and bone constructs. Um, constraints uh, and overhaul the 2D animation version as well in the editor, make the editor more resilient to files, uh, change added externally. That would definitely be nice. So when things happen outside of from non-imported files, it does not do a great time with it. So we're going to have some improvements there. Provide some ways to access internal sub-resources of saved scenes. Implement GD script refactoring tools. Uh, refactoring is always nice. So you can do things like renaming or move something and have tools built in the editor for doing that. And implement editor support for creating, updating source code for GD extensions. Um, and then asset import, improve compatibility with Blender. Uh, you can already import .blend files, but it's limited to models, textures, lights, and cameras. Uh, calls by calling into Blender and asking Blender to write a GLTF file, which Godot then imports. Therefore, everything we want to export from Blender needs to be exported to GLTF data, including GLTF extensions, and then Godot needs to import these all in the order to make its way into Godot. So they want to have better integration or better compatibility with Blender. Uh, improved import dialog to provide more control over imported resources. Add preview icons on... Um, imported scenes uh, such as GLB, FBX, and Blender files. Uh, improved importer performance, nobody would complain about that. Make scene inheritance more robust. So scene inheritance is the concept of creating a scene based on an existing one. There's a feature that should work well in theory, but can be quite finicky, yes. Yes, it very much can. So uh, having improvements to the way that scene inheritance works would be a good thing. On the platform side of things, add screen reader support using access kit integration, uh, investigate delays in window creation, distribute uh, separate debug symbols, uh, improve gamepad support. So receive a number of issues about gamepad support as the number of gamepads never cease to increase. As we wish to support as many input devices as possible, we want to work towards better support and improve behavior of multiple monitors with different resolutions and DPI scaling factors. To be honest, Handling multiple monitors and handling DPI and then handling multiple DPIs, that has always been a nightmare. Um, and then on the Android side of things, improved debugging uh, of reports from the Google Play Console and support for external textures for AR Core devices. On Linux side of things, multiple window support for Wayland Compositor. On the web side of things, improve the web export sizes, improve loading time for web builds, customize engine builds by detecting used features from Godot, and continue to improve compatibility across devices and browsers. On the XR, which is AR and VR, all mashed together now. Um, enhance OpenXR action map to support binding modifiers. Make action map system available to WebXR. Open XR support for DirectX 12 and Metal. Uh, move Chronos loader support from our vendor plugin to the core of Godot. Uh, add support for render models, i.e. displaying the correct controller and other peripherals. And continue de uh, development of the Godot XR tools library. Scripting side of things, implement namespaces for scripting language. Uh, one of the main complaints with GD script language is the lack of namespaces. A namespace is a way to group code code by a common name. This permits the use of uh, classes using the same name as long as they can be differentiated by their namespace. So you could have a global function called add, and you could put in a namespace like Mike's Utilities, and then it won't collide.
tied with a global function called add that was in system utility. So namespaces are very useful in that regard. Problem can be found with .NET and GD extensions too. The problem occurs at the registration phase of classes in our internal database. With namespaces, plugin developers could use their own uh, class names without worrying about clashing with users' internal ones. That would be nice. Uh, GD script, polish and ensure that class name is robust and works in all cases. Improve performance via compilation. So while it's fast enough to operate as glue between nodes and basic logic, is, uh, its performance is lackluster when it comes to pure data crunching. We would like to improve the process capabilities of the language and its runtime. Nobody would complain about that. So currently investing whether to compile GD script or to use AOT ahead of time or JIT just in time compilation techniques. This would be nice because a lot of people say that um, GD script is a performance factor. And if you did give the ability to compile it down, especially, or even if it was JIT or, or uh, like AO time is basically normal compilation. JIT is uh, scripting version. Uh, and you kind of need to have AOT because that's required on Apple devices. Uh, but JIT generally is good enough. And a lot of times when you JIT a uh, scripting language, you can see improvements like three to five times, like some pretty staggering amounts. So hopefully they go somewhere there and adding traits. So the main way to reuse code when writing code in GDScript is to use inheritance. Well, it works well for the most part. It leaves developers to rewrite a lot of code when the method cannot be used. So traits is the path forward uh, to solve that issue. So add a trait system to GDScript. On the .NET side of thing, enable users to export their C-sharp projects on the web. So the lack of web target is still an annoyance there. Deprecate .NET builds for a .NET plugin. Uh, for the time being, users are required to download an entirely separate Godot build in order to use .NET, uh, C-sharp features. With our new upcoming .NET module, we intend to support C-sharp with a simple plugin. Everyone wins as users won't have to choose a special version to run C Sharp, and it reduces the number of builds on our side. It also simplified .NET maintenance. So basically, you know how right now when you download uh, Godot, you have to choose between either the the mono the C -Sharp, the .NET version or the standard version. That's going to go away, and the .NET implementation would all be done as a module. Uh, host a .NET specific documentation website, uh, and then GD extensions allow compiling Godot as a library that can be loaded and used by other applications. Uh, so you can basically then embed Godot into another app. Uh, I, I actually thought that um, uh, the whole um, Swift part that was implemented recently, Godot and Swift did this, but I'm, I'm not 100% certain. Uh, allow GD extensions to communicate with one another. So that, you know, multiple GD, having extensions that have dependencies on other extensions is always a little tricky, uh, but that is uh, a neat ability. And add the ability to integrate, uh, to enable disable GD extensions in the project settings. So that would be kind of nice. So you can just turn them off if you don't need them. And that is the roadmap of priorities on the Godot game engine. Some pretty nice stuff in there. I think they've got, it's a very reasonable list of items. There's not too many pie in the sky or features that you'll never, ever, ever actually use stuff there. But I'm curious, what do you think? What do you think of the priorities of the Godot team? Do you like what you see? Is there something missing? Let me know. Comments down below. I'll talk to you all later. Goodbye.